this video is to sort of make up the information that was not included that we think should be included so much so that it is necessary that we put forth this video now the first thing we're going to do is pause you so we can pull up the screen give us one second as we mentioned it is all about capacity now I want you to understand the legal definition for capacity in contract law a person's ability to satisfy the elements required for someone to enter into binding contracts, i.e. capacity. For example, capacity rules often require certain aspects, person be of legal age and so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's look at what Wikipedia says referencing this information and you can thus verify it at a latter time. The capacity of natural and juristical persons, so you know that there's a judicial person and there is a natural person or a living person and a non-living fictional person. Pay attention, these are capacities. Do you have to announce that you are a living person? No, because a computer can make announcements. So how do you prove that you're alive? Ladies and gentlemen, you do it, one, by affidavit, two, by having a witness with you, another living person. Now, mind you, I can't tell you how to work that out in a court situation, but who can rebut that presumption since they operate on presumptions you stand up in the courtroom the judge has somebody announcing it it has witnesses to prove it was there the idea that individuals had of bringing witnesses to court remember the judge has the authority operating under robert's rules to control the court to control the administrative order of things so when it is your turn to speak, you can speak and say, excuse me, sissy, could you go ahead and let them know who you is? The judge is going to ask, who is this? Oh, this is sissy. Sissy, go ahead. You can speak for yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm here to give witness that this is a living person, that this is not a dead or deceased person. Judge can say whatever he wants to at that point. Oh, no, no, hold on. Not finished. You see, I'm here to give witness that Sissy is a living person, not a dead or deceased person. So since we're both bearing witness to each other and you have two witnesses saying that they are alive, if you need a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth, we can furnish that to the court if it should so desire. We believe that you have a deceased entity before the court, and we just need to know your jurisdiction. That's all. Because we, we don't understand all that's going on, but we do understand that something fishy is here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not telling you to do any of this. We're making the suggestion that since capacity is capacity, and everyone in the courtroom is in a position of capacity, they are there in one capacity or another. This word, in the law sense, denotes some ability, power, qualification, or competency of person, natural or artificial, to perform civil acts. Here is another legal definition. The capability or power under law of a person to occupy a particular status in relationship to another, or to engage in blah, 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 blah. I assure you, it's all about capacity. Thus, it's all about trust. Because in a trust relationship, you sit in a certain capacity. So those of you who have the sat packs, the original sat packs or the current sat packs, create your declaration of trust which identifies you and place your capacity there as being the beneficiary.
of that trust and how you are the beneficiary of all the assets of that straw creature. Do not call it a straw man. Call it a legal fiction. Call it a juristic person. J-U-R-I-S-D-I-C. Juristic person. Call it. Let's make sure I spelled that correctly. We'll get back to capacity in a second. J-U. I'm looking for the spelling, so let's make sure of it. And it's not jurisdictional. And it it could be with a T. No, no, that's a jurist. No, I'm not looking for jurist. Not looking for jurist. Give me a second. It might be a T. Sorry, that is the... And it might be without the D. Yeah, juristic. What is a juristic person? What is a juristic person in law? So let's find out the capacity of a juristic person. The term includes a firm, a corporation, a union, an association, or other organization capable of suing or being sued in a court of law. It is a legal fiction. Now, hold on. We went to Cornell Law. Cornell Law, they actually have a statute that defines what a juristic person is. See, hold on. I want you all to pay attention to their definition. The term person in any other word, and excuse me, in any other word or term used to designate the applicant or other entitled to a benefit, privilege, or render liable under the provision of this chapter includes a juristic person as well as a natural person. The term juristic person includes a firm, corporation, union, association, or other organization capable of suing or being sued in a court of law. This is Title 15. Let's go to section, because I believe this will be definitions. And there you go, construction and definition. Now, again, the word commerce, this is letting you know what's going on. The term person or any other word used to designate, so it describes what a person is. That's why you have to tell them that you're not a term of law nor a term of art. You are a person, a natural person. See, you don't want to use this term because they created their own definition for the term. So natural person is a term that they understand. The term person also includes the United States, any agency or instrumentality thereof. The term person includes any instrumentality of the United States. The term person includes any agency of the United States. The term person includes the United States. Why? Because they have constitutional rights. That's why corporations are persons too. Hobby, lobby. And there are so many other cases where the United States have ruled that corporations are persons too. It says, or any other individual, firm, or corporation acting for the United States and with the authorization and consent of the United States. The United States, any agency, instrumentality thereof, any individual firm or corporation acting for the United States and with the authorization and consent of the United States shall be subject to the provisions of this chapter in the same manner and to the same extent as any non-governmental entity, i.e. you. The term person also includes any state, any instrumentality of a state, any office, sir, or employee of the state or instrumentality of a state acting in his or her official capacity. It's all about capacity, ladies and gentlemen. Any state and any such instrumentality offer or an employee shall be subject to the provisions of this chapter in the same manner and in the same to the same extent that in any other person or non-governmental entity. Now remember, in order for you to be bound by any of their stuff, you have to apply 
you have to volunteer. That's why when you get a driver's license, you apply to become exactly that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we just wanted to bring this information to your attention, especially about capacity. There were a lot of things that people just were not aware of. And this is um, Patrick Devine's. Uh, this is tribute to Patrick Devine. I was a fan of Mr. Patrick Devine. He is one of the gurus and yes. But however, we want to let you know that the information, especially by Thomas Clark Nelson, is viable to your attention. And as stated, the document will be up. I'm actually glad that we've done this video to make sure that the documents are up. Document will be up for your perusal. There is this other information that's at casetext.com. We stated about suing a trust. Each one of your SAP packs, the old and the new, are trust agreements. Someone wants to sue a trust, they just can't sue just to be suing. If you are sued after establishing a trust, then they must sue the parties in their proper capacity. Many of you who have had the arbitration agreements are being sued in your personal capacity. Do you know that the trust protects you from liability? This is suing a trust. Because suing a trust in Texas and New York necessitates naming the trustee in the pleadings, then the courts in these states must look to the substance of the complaint to determine the real party to the controversy. The court will now consider the five different approaches that the court and the Fifth Circuit have taken to determine the real party of the controversy. For example, the court in transcontinental realty looked to the substance of the complaint and not just the caption and held that Wells Fargo Bank was only a nominal or formal party suing on behalf of the trust, which is the real and substantial party to the controversy with the defendant. The court granted the defendant's motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, where a careful review of the complaint made it clear that Wells Fargo was only a nominal or formal party suing on behalf of the trust, which was the real party substantial to the controversy. The attorneys in every case are the party suing on behalf of the bank, suing on behalf of the corporation, suing on behalf of their client. Their client must not only be named in the complaint, but their client must be made to appear in the court the same as you are made to appear. They cannot wait till the day of trial. Has to appear on the record prior to trial. It's a technicality, but it's a unique technicality. Plus, we are also bringing to your attention, ladies and gentlemen, that each one of your contracts or trusts. If you can bring to the court's attention that you are not the trustee of the trust and that this matter involved a trust and that they did not name the real party of interest, then there you go. Because they are suing a trust, the matter involves a trust. And for those of you who did contracts and the bank decided they wanted to come after you, and if they are bringing a claim that there might be a breach of trust, then they will have to bring that claim. They can't just bring a lawsuit. They have to actually put in there that somehow the trust has been breached. They're not doing this because you are not challenging them. So, look, I am not a subscriber to um case text but i'm letting all of you know that this is a very good source of information for finding what you need okay i just put a trust the real party and it should have been a comma because we want to highlight trust and i don't want to put trust in parentheses or quotation. Let's see. I think it already did it for me. So hold on. This is Hall versus Hall. 
The trust is not the real party in interest in any of the claims asserted in the complaint. Indeed, the trust is merely a nominal party. While the trust may have some derivative or successor interest in the outcome of this matter, it is certainly not the real party of interest. This is when the courts pick and find a way to remove something that the law says should be there. Because the trust is not a real party of interest, the court need not look to the trust citizenship for the purpose of determining whether the diversity of jurisdiction is proper. A federal court must disregard nominal and formal parties and rest jurisdiction only upon the citizenship of the real party to the controversy. Again, this is about capacity. And they're saying that the trust does not have capacity to be a trust. What happens is the court wants to maintain control in this matter. And that's why they pick this narrow little point. But remember, you're bringing up a technicality. So what happens here? You have to now appeal that. But you have to understand that your contract is specific with an arbitration clause. Your contract is a trust. If they make a decision regarding that trust, then that makes the trust a real party. The contract is evidence of a trust agreement. The banks have a trust agreement with the parties, especially when it comes to foreclosure. If there is a trust agreement, hold on. What the courts have said is that a deed of trust is not a trust. So I just typed in a deed of trust is a trust. What you'll find that oftentimes the courts and their decisions contradict each other. So let's see. The fact that the statute refers to a deed of trust rather than, or trust deeds rather than a deed of trust is of no moment. In other words, there was no controversy there. A trust deed or deed of trust is the exact same thing. For these instruments are essentially the same security device, except deeds of trust have been provided for by the state of Washington statute and may be enforced by non-judicial foreclosure, whereas trust deeds were devices that existed at common law, but were foreclosed as mortgages. Now, they'll give you the little Washington code. Ladies and gentlemen, let's explain something here. They're saying that deeds of trust exist as a result of statute, and thus they are not actual trusts. Then don't name them trust, because you only have one legal definition for a trust. California Court of Appeals held that under the New York trust law, a transfer of a deed of trust in contravention of the trust documents was, is void, not merely voidable. And under California law, a borrower can challenge the assignment of his or her note and deed of trust if the direct uh, defect asserted would void the assignment. You can challenge the assignment of the deed of trust, ladies and gentlemen, in California and every other state. People have been doing this and they've been doing it successfully. In the law, in several states, in order to transfer a property, there has to be a proper chain of custody. They have to follow the procedure and rules. I would definitely say those of you who are beginning to face foreclosure, go over these cases that are here. Look for what your defenses are and what your offenses are. Another possibility, which was acknowledged by both sides in oral arguments, is that the true holder of the note and the deed of trust cannot be determined at this stage of proceedings. You have a right to know who that holder of the deed of trust is. You have the right to know who the holder of the note is. It cannot be a quote unquote, uh, what do you call that? Bundling of securities. They have to know who it is. There has to be documentation. This lack of certainty regarding who holds the deed of trust is not uncommon when a securitized trust is involved. Ladies and gentlemen, MERS. This whole mortgage-backed security junk. Okay, you have the right because only the true holder of the note and of the deed of trust can sue to foreclose. 
These attorneys do not have an agreement with them. The trustee may come in, but the trustee will have to prove that it has the authority to act as trustee. That's why the assignment is necessary. Now, according to their litigation handbook for mortgage-backed securities, often difficult for securitized trust to prove ownership by showing a chain of assignment of the loan from the originating lender. That is your defense, individuals. I told you, I am not a, uh, what you call it, of case text. I'm not a subscriber. But you hear me advocating that you go to case text and do your research. If you're about to lose your home, go over this video, show this to your brothers, sisters, cousins, nieces, uncles, so that they can now handle their cases. You saw what I put in, a deed of trust is a trust. Okay, a deed of trust to evidence the indebtedness. Okay, on January 4th, 1988, Daniel executed a promissory note and a deed of trust to evidence indebtedness. He must have been in bankruptcy. Must have been in bankruptcy. Uh, county and owned by his parents. They agreed to lend Daniel the money and thereafter executed the deed conveying their interest in the subject property to Daniel. And then Daniel evidenced the promissory note and the deed of trust is evidence of indebtedness. Promissory note itself contained the following language. This note is given as a purchase money note. It is secured by the purchase money deed of trust. The deed of trust, however, contained no language indicating that it was purchase money deed of trust. It merely contained reference to the promissory note executed by Daniel for $30,000. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let me make sure you understand. You all must get this. This goes on every single day. When you purchase a property, and this he was just getting a loan, but when you purchase a property, they have you put up as a collateral the property that you don't even own yet because you haven't received the loan. You cannot do that. You can make a promise to pay, but you cannot promise to pay something that you don't own, that does not belong to you. You don't have the authority. Possessions is nine-tenths of the law. So that little one-tenth does not give you the right to take somebody else's property and put it up as collateral. And that's exactly what you are doing when you are purchasing these properties. That's exactly what you are doing when you are purchasing these properties. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to go for a moment. One. Okay, I apologize for that, everyone. Uh, first thing I have to do is turn the mic back on. So one sec. Okay, back 